Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you for attending our weekly annuity training. Appreciate your, all your time and efforts to be here today. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please type them into the questions panel. It should be on that little uh, the little square uh, on your screen there. If you have any questions or if you have any kind of technical difficulties, uh, please uh, type them in and we'll try to take care of that uh, as you go. And again, I'll answer questions as we go through the training as well. But today I want to talk about handling objections, okay? Handling objections in the annuity sales process. And what I'm going to do is kind of go through that what that process looks like and then kind of give you at towards the end uh, some of our presentations and our materials that our agents use on the annuity sales to kind of how to overcome the objection before it even becomes objection. And that'll probably make a little bit more sense as we go through the training. But again, uh, I really want to talk about you know, handling objections in the sales process. And again, this is going to also help you with your life insurance sales as well. So uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. And at the end, take my email and I'll make sure that uh, I get the, the uh, slides and the information from the presentations to you um, if you're active with national brokerage and so forth so that you can use these in selling life insurance and annuities, okay? So again, I want to talk about handling objections and overcoming objections. And at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, objections are the result of having what's, what we call a, a, a poor a poor selling process, meaning that we either became transactional salesperson or we, we really were just trying to close, 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 and we really didn't build a plan or, or um, uh, meet a need or a goal for the client. Because at the end of the day, we would never want to coerce the buyer into reversing their buying decision, uh, uh, meaning that if, if, if you're just forcing them, I, I know an agent that all he used to sit in a client's house all day long. He'd be there for seven, eight hours. And finally, they, just to get him out of the house, they would say yes. And they would take the application and then they would they would stop the application or free look the policy. And he had usually like 60 or 70 percent of his business uh, uh, free look the policies because, again, he just kept driving sales, sales, sales to him. And again, we don't really want to get and lead to that buyer's remorse. The key to handling an objection is to overcome that objection before it even becomes an issue. And the way that we do that, ladies and gentlemen, is we, we really have to bond with the client. Uh, like they say, nobody cares until they know that you care, right? We have to listen more than we talk. So we have to ask the right questions. And we've talked about this several times on our last uh, sales presentation. So we have to listen more than we talk throughout the sales presentation, and that's asking the right questions. And then we also have to understand that one product is not a fit for every client. And uh, again, that goes to meeting certain needs, whether the client's looking for income distribution, whether they're looking for accumulation with annuities, whether they're looking for life insurance and cash value life insurance. We have to understand that one product is not going to fit every client, but we have to be able to pivot within those sales, within that sales process to those products, right? And specifically when it comes to annuities, we have to focus on concept selling. It's going to get you a lot further than pitching products and pitching rates and pitching company features. Because at the end of the day, if if you're doing a one call close, you may have some buyer's remorse. But if you're doing a two call close and you give them you pitch rates and companies and products, they're going to take that information. They're going to go research the company, find some something that happened 30, 40, 50 years ago, and, uh, or the companies uh, may have a bad rating or they something happened. They're going to find some information on why uh, they don't want to do business with you. Okay, So w w at the end of the day, we have to have a good sales process and handling the objection before it even becomes an objection uh, uh, when, we're, when we're first in, on our first appointments. Okay? And, and at the end of the day, the key is many times prospects don't, don't, don't know that when they buy an annuity, it's because it doesn't achieve their goals. Okay, So at the end of the day, many times prospects don't know the features and the values of an annuity. That's why we have to be coming or we have to come from an educational role. We have to have some kind of sales process. We have to be able to uncover a pain. Okay, So instead of overcoming the objection, we have to be able to move on to the next client if the client uh, becomes uh, to that point where you know they they start they start saying that you know that 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 they're they're interested in 
in fees and they want growth and they want to see, you know, uh, calculations and so forth, or they have that engineer mindset. So at the end of the day, you have to be able to pick on uh, keys and cues in that sales process. And that's why we have our fundamental annuity questionnaire. That's why we have our detailed data sheet. That's why we have our uh, questions worth millions where we have those type of questions that are going to lead you in overcoming objections or at least uncover that pain. And if they have an objection, it's going to present itself within the sales process because we want to be able to uh, address the objection before it arises, show the prospect why the annuity fits their goals in spite of a negative aspect. And, and what I mean by a negative aspect of buying the annuity is, you know, maybe surrender charges or maybe um, a low interest rate environment. Uh, they may say, hey, they heard about this company or they, 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 they've never heard about this company. And we're going to go through some of those objections here. Uh, and, you know, they just don't feel comfortable. So we have to educate them within your sales presentation so that they can make the right buy buying decision. Okay, because at the end of the day, we have to understand why people are buying life insurance and why people are making decisions on purchasing annuities. Okay, and those really come down to there is some kind of a change going on in their life or taking place, whether they're getting ready to retire. Maybe uh, we've had recently just uh, seems really recently that a lot of clients have been getting divorces and having uh, IRA, or, yeah, IRA settlements and, and, and money settlements, uh, the death of a family member inheriting some money um, and so forth. So there's probably some kind of change going on in their life. And that's a perfect time to educate them about annuities and life insurance. Um, also, the reason why people make decisions is they want to feel good about being in a better position. And sometimes when people have set up IRAs and annuities and, and, and accounts, they probably set these accounts up 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and so they don't know that there is maybe a better position for them. Maybe they didn't know that they can borrow uh, from uh, 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 the death benefit on a cash value on an IUL. So maybe they don't know that there's these these amazing vehicles that have become very popular over the last probably 10, 15 years um, that could be beneficial to them right now. So they, they, they the reason they make that change, they want to feel good about being in a better position. And we always talk about risk reversal in our sales presentation and life insurance and annuities is the perfect formula for risk reversal. We talked about risk reversal a couple of weeks ago on how on every sale, uh, one person is, is, is being more advantaged than the other. We have to be able as a salesperson, put that ball in their court and make them understand that they're going to be more advantageous, uh, more advantaged by doing business with you than not doing business with you. Okay. Uh, because at the end of the day, your prospects and clients need to feel protected and comfortable. And that risk reversal feeling is, is completely, uh, uh, if sold right is a complete umbrella when selling life insurance and annuities. And, and, you know, when you, take that process and that sales presentation uh you know it makes it is e it makes it easy but you have to make it as easy as possible for your client to understand the benefits of doing business with you okay you may not be the right advisor for everybody but for the right person you can be and do amazing things for the right situation okay so they want to advance their current position by feeling educated about the unknown people are, are really curious okay um, and Jack Marion who when you know I got into the, the, the annuity business you know 15 16 17 years ago um, Jack Marion was like the buzz back then and I'll never forget this quote and I think it's something that every person that's in sales not just life insurance and annuities or fee-based planners if you're an IAR or an RIA uh, is that what he says this what I found is when I connect with the consumer and if you do it right you don't get objections that are really excuses and there's no close because the entire sales process the consumer is doing their own close. And I'll give you a perfect example. I know an agent, it was probably about 10 years ago, this agent was writing a ton, a ton of annuity business and life insurance. And he got up in front of, the, you know, this meeting with like 200 agents. And these agents started asking questions like, how do you overcome this objection? And he said, I don't get that objection. And they would say, well, how do you handle this objection or when your client does this? And he says, well, my client does that. And they never say that. And so what he found was that when he went through his pr presentation, what we saw and what we found was that he was overcoming objections. He made it simple. He made it clear. He made it precise. He was overcoming those objections that those agents were getting within his 
seminar. And then when he went to his seminar, he regurgitated the same information, just maybe in a different way in the presentation and the, the appointment. And then when he was asking them questions, it was to answer those particular, uh, it was to answer and give an answer to those particular information that they were seeking. And it was pretty phenomenal. So, and, and that's exactly what Jack Marion's talking about here is if you connect with your, your, your clients, if you educate them throughout your social media, throughout your marketing, throughout your educational, uh, whether it's uh, workshops or appointments, you're going to overcome objections in your sales presentations before they even arise. And the funniest thing about that agent was he never went into an appointment knowing whether he was going to sell an annuity or a life insurance policy. He just knew that he was going to sell the concept of life insurance and annuities. And at the end of the day, the clients never really knew they were purchasing an annuity or life insurance till he pulled out the application. And that's how good that sales process was. Now, obviously, he went through suitability and disclosure and he explained the products and the presentation and the quotes and all that. But that was already after the fact that he had built a, a phenomenal relationship. He had gained their trust and he had the ability to get them to purchase whatever he said because he, he was meeting their goals and their needs. And that was pretty much the magic behind his present his, his 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 success okay because at the end of the day ladies and gentlemen business is is life insurance business can be very stressful when you're getting objections and when business is non-existent and when there is this uh thought process going on when the client's controlling that buyer sellers dance and you're really not getting the sales you're, you're maybe pumping out a a lot of money for marketing, but you're not getting the sales. But it, there's something within your sales presentation that probably just needs a slight tweaking because at the end of the day, you're probably getting what we call the blame game where you start to blame the leads or maybe the, the, the mailer for your seminars. Uh, your seminar attendance is low. Maybe you're not getting enough people hitting your website. Uh, maybe you're not connecting well with people in your community at your local affinity groups, whatever it may be. Maybe you're not getting enough responses to your radio commercials or, or, or shows. So whatever it may be, you're, you're starting to blame it on the marketing. Maybe you're blaming it on the economy because the economy, it's a bad economy or it's a good economy. The market's coming back, so they don't want to move their money. Maybe it's my FMO because they're not giving me any kind of marketing materials or support. Whatever that may be, it becomes a blame game. And more than likely, like I said, you're hearing prospects that are telling you, I want to think it over. Uh, they disappear. They don't return your emails or they don't return your calls. Um, I need to check with my kids or, or my broker uh, about this. Or a client uh, says, I read a lot of bad things about annuities. So they've already created that objection before you even went and asked for the business, right? So if you're getting those kind of objections, like thinking it over or we'll get back to you or give us some time and they disappear, there is something within your sales process that didn't resonate or connect with the prospect at that time. Time, okay, and that's going to lead, ladies and gentlemen, to what we call a lack of production. Okay, the problem there is what we call all the time you're doing a lot of unpaid consulting. Okay, uh, when we say unpaid consulting, is you're giving your prospects and your clients uh, quotes and information, and you're, you're you're teaching them about these companies and and these products, but then they never come back to you and, and do the business. And I see that all the time when. Well, I'm talking to an agent and an agent says, hey, I got this client. This client was shown XYZ company. Can we beat that? That is a perfect example of where the agent who positioned XYZ company did not connect with that advice, with that client. And so now that client went and came to one of our advisors and said, hey, is this product good? And is there something better? So that tells me that, the, that 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 person did a lot of unpaid consulting, and our agent is going to be the benefit of that that business, or vice versa. Maybe you're doing a lot of unpaid consulting, and you never hear from your client, and they're going back and purchasing from a family member, or a friend of a friend's cousin who's in the business, or knows a guy, whatever that may be. Okay. And then the problem leads to you start taking rejection personally, and it starts to affect your performance. Okay. Uh, and the clients start to sense that you're desperate for for sale or you go right into the closes and 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 not and and making the the, the uh, sale about you and not about them and you may not even know that and the next thing you know they feel like they're being sold rather than they feel like they're getting a plan or they're being consulted okay so that's a very big thing I, I want you to think about ladies and gentlemen in your sales presentation whether it's life insurance annuities or, or selling real estate or whatever it is that you sell you know 
be come from an educational role and be a consultant by asking uh, uh, very, very uh, emotional questions. Don't just pitch products because then now you're coming from a transactional sale and you may not even know that. OK, so so keep keep a, a, a mindset of uh, are you coming from a consultant and an educational role or are you coming from a, a salesperson and a pitching role? OK, so so keep be mindful of that in your sales presentation and, and that may help you because at the end of the day. You really have to take a look at the, your attitude and maybe you're really trying to force a sale. Maybe your behavior, maybe you're kind of all over the place and every appointment is different and you're asking different questions and appointments and, you know, maybe you're late for your appointments and so forth. Uh, maybe it has something to do with your technique and your presentation. You're not covering certain aspects of life insurance or annuities or, or investments or whatever it is that you sell. Maybe there's something in your technique where you're kind of just staying focused on one particular angle and not pivoting and being able to uh, recommend certain uh, products to, to different needs and goals for different prospects and clients. And that really comes down to having a daily routine and having a sales process routine and running your appointments a particular way and making sure that you you ask questions to answer or you ask questions to get an answer to, to to get another answer to a question and all the stuff that we've talked about over the last several months on our annuity training is uh, uh really we want to take you want to take a look at your process because the problem is is you don't want to be over educating and not getting them to trust and build uh, a build a relationship with you and then they take their business elsewhere and this is kind of what it looks like when we're getting those objections and you're coming from a transactional role compared to a process oriented role okay that transactional role uh, is looking at putting clients assets into one annuity okay maybe maybe they're not a good fit for annuity maybe you're a fee-based planner and need to take over the accounts and, and do some fee Based planning and sell them a hybrid annuity with long-term care benefits, uh, but you just didn't ask the right questions and find out what their goals and concerns were because they're too busy pitching a particular product and being transactional. Uh, maybe you're focused on the sale and not about the client, and you're not really engaging them, connecting with them, being like them, and becoming likable. Uh, or maybe, I know the biggest thing too with a lot of agents that transition from life insurance and health insurance to annuities is they're used to doing one call closes. And when it comes to annuities, uh, I, I'm not saying that you can't do a one call close, and I'm not saying that you can get a sale quickly and effectively. I'm just saying that if you do it the right way, <coughs> excuse me. If you do it the right way, um, you're not going to be a one-hit wonder. You're 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 not going to be a one-call close, and you're not just going to get that annuity sale. You're going to get that life insurance sale. You're going to get that annuity sale. You're going to take over if you're a, a, a fee-based advisor. You're going to take over for some money under management. Uh, you're going to sell long-term care insurance. So you're not just going to sell one product. You're going to get ancillary sales and build advocates to your business. All right. And then uh, when you become transactional, you're trying to make every prospect a client. I think the most important aspect about uh, sales is knowing that every prospect is potentially a client, but every prospect is not the right client. And I hope that makes sense. So, you know, we're trying to sell annuities. Annuities are not for everybody. And maybe they have the right amount of life insurance and maybe they have long term care or maybe they have uh, a, a broker that they like that's managing their money. OK, so maybe it's the best idea to just tell your client that you're not the right advisor for them. And what you're going to find out is when the timing's right, they're going to come back and be the client for you or they're going to recommend family and friends to you and become advocates to your business. OK, so knowing that every prospect has the potential to be a client, but maybe they're not the right client is going to grow your business and it's going to allow you to quit chasing and turning your wheels in the mud and it's going to allow you to move on to the next client for the next opportunities to get a sale. Okay, and I'll give you a perfect example of that. I had an agent that was, we were just recently working on a case and it was uh, an annuity that had long term care benefits and the client or the agent had first originally pitched the annuity with the long-term care benefits. They were looking at some life insurance and they were looking at just a regular annuity and the client just didn't know, you know, he was like, well, my broker's making me a lot of money, but I got this chunk of money I want to put in. Long story short, the client decided to go with the hybrid annuity with long-term care benefits, was declined for uh, due to health issues, and, and then the agent had to go back, and then the client really just couldn't make up his mind. And sometimes the, the, I, told the, I told the agent, I said, the best thing to do is to tell the client that it's just not right to do business right now. 
uh, maybe keep that money where uh, in in the market if if he's if he's happy with it. And the the agent uh, was 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 kind of upset. Was like, I want to keep getting this this business and business. And I told the agent, I said, you're you're really going to to have a problem if you try to sell this person an annuity and it just doesn't work out. You're going to get buyer's remorse, or they're going to have a complaint. They're gonna they're gonna surrender the policy and so forth. And and sure enough, uh, the agent uh, walked away and the uh, client sent him a referral. And so that's what I'm talking about is, is don't try to make every prospect a client. Uh, try to find the right clients and move on to the next. And, and when you process oriented by doing that, you're, you're really focused on structuring plans for your clients. And when your clients know that you're putting a plan together, whether they buy that plan or not, and we've talked about them making buying decisions, whether they buy that plan or not, they really know that you care. They build a relationship with you. Maybe it's not the right time. They're going to recommend referrals to you. They're going to recommend family and friends. They're going to know that you have their best interest and they're going to re recommend people when you come from a process oriented uh, uh, situation because uh, you're, you're, you're always focused on the best interest of the client. You're continued focused on building relationships uh, before you focus on getting sales and your clients again become advocates. So we want to take them from prospects to clients to advocates and the outcome is you're going to get a lot more referrals in your sales process over the the year, uh, uh, the year going on. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about why you get objections, and I think this is probably very important. And and as you go through and we talk about this, you're probably going to think of some cases where you were like, you know what? That's exactly what happened to me in my situation and what's going on. This is what I need to talk about. Why you're getting objections in the sales process. Number one, this is probably the most important thing. Number one, there is a lack of perceived value in your products. Not that your product is in superior. It's just you didn't do an, a good enough sales job uh, positioning and educating the prospect about the benefits of your products. Okay. Number two. The prospect did not feel like you were like them. Okay, the prospect didn't feel like you were like them, and um, um, uh, 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 they didn't feel like they connected or resonated with you. Okay, number three, there is a lack of urgency in buying the product. That is probably the most important thing because you may be so focused on one particular company and product instead of selling concept and asking the right questions and putting a plan together, there may be a lack of urgency of buying a particular product. Maybe you're trying to just pitch one product and maybe they need long-term care or life insurance or cash value life insurance, whatever it may be, and you're over here trying to pitch them a, a MIGA fixed rate annuity and, and you're just on two different levels, okay? So there's a, there's a lack of urgency in doing business together. Um, number four. Uh, the issues with the decision maker. I, I am telling you, if you look at this, you will probably see a big difference in your sales process, okay? Prospects might have two different goals and not on the same page. And what I'm talking here is about a husband and a wife or a spousal situation where that's why we, we do our money to income presentation where we, if we have two prospects. Number one, we're trying to find out who makes the buying decision. And number two, what are their buying languages or how do we sell to their buying languages? And then number three, what are their goals together and how do they rate those goals uh, together and how they coincide together, right? So we're going to control that process. And we've done that through our money to income presentation and all of our presentations that we've used. But it, you'll, you'll be funny how a lot of advisors will focus on trying to sell the male half of the relationship and maybe the, the, the woman and the, the wife controls all the buying decisions. She 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 does the checkbook. She she handles all the finances or vice versa. So we have to find out issues with the decision maker. Maybe they have kids that they consult. Maybe their kids are really close. Maybe their kids a uh, uh, an insurance advisor or financial broker or uh, just really smart kid and 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 they always consult with their kids. So maybe you want to have their kids in the the appointment process. Okay. So again, we want to find out if there's any kind of issues with the decision maker or that decision making process. All right. And that's what we talk about that outside influence. Maybe the kids uh, a family member has 
pitch them a product or is in the business or they got an attorney that also sells annuities or, or their, their CPA sells annuities. So we want to, in, in, in building a relationship with them, we want to ask questions on outside influences and understanding uh, those outside influences and how can that can affect your sales process. All right. And then the last one is prospects believe it's safer to do nothing. And right now we're starting to see that with the market going up and being at its highest points and then it's going down and then it kind of been going up and interest rates are, you know, they lowered interest rates and the interest rate environment. So prospects believe right now because there's so much activity going on, they believe that it's safer to do nothing, right? And we don't want them to do nothing if it's not in their best interest. So we have to uh, we have to ask questions and engage and analyze and and and, and investigate. Uh, and diagnose uh, individual situations when it comes to why we're getting those objections. And 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 ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, here's here's the objections you're you're going to be getting when it comes to annuities. I, I mean, you know, I've been doing this for 17, 18 years now, and these the the, the, the objections never change. They re they really don't change because at the end of the day, the annuity process, the annuity product. The annuity concept hasn't changed very much. Okay, they're inventing, you know, income riders and death benefit riders and all these features, but the products really haven't changed from the standpoint of what the annuity is designed to do, and that's designed to keep your money safe, grow your grow your money safely and securely without any risk, and protecting your principal and creating an income stream. Right at the end of the day, those are the those are the the foundations of an annuity. And the objections are still staying the same. You're going to get this objection of low interest rate environment, low rates. The 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 preemption process for the client's mind should be more focused on uh, what 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 they have to take and to protect to protect their principal on upside potential ha is limited. So what they're saying is is you know I'd rather risk my money than getting a low interest rate environment. Okay, they're focused on. You know, you know, you haven't sold that concept of at this stage in your life, is it about the return of your money or the return on your money? And or with this account is about uh, uh, keeping your money protected and hitting singles and doubles and not home runs. I always talk about that. Use that analogy. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, we're going to hit singles and doubles with annuities. We're not going to hit home runs. But, you know, you're in a different stage in life right now. It's about the return of your money, not the return on your money. All right. Also. You may get an objection of can't access my money. Uh, and what they're really asking is, is my money safe and I, can I get to my money uh, in case of emergencies uh, and can I get my money back? Now, again, risk reversal. If that's the thing, pivot to a product that has a return to premium option. Pivot to a product that has, you know, maybe a bonus that, that is a true bonus that can offset some of those surrender penalties like American equity. So there's a lot of, uh, if, if this objection comes up, know how to pivot that and sell to that, that, that objection and, and sell to that concern, okay? It's a great opportunity to talk about that risk reversal and liquidity options. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, um, you, when was the last time you touched this money? Oh, well, we've never touched this money. We plan on passing it on or using it for income. Okay, so Mr. and Mrs. Jones, this is a retirement account that you plan on taking income for the rest of your life. Yes. Okay, so we plan on taking an income distribution. So having access to your money is only in the form of, of, of taking income, correct? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, let me show you how this works with an income rider or with interest withdrawals or whatever that may be. So we, we have to be able to overcome that objection within that sales process, all right? What if Mr. and Mrs. Jones say, man, I heard bad things about annuities. Annuities have high surrender charges, and once your money's in there, they're locked in. What, what the client is really saying, the greater the surrender charge, the greater the return should be, right? So why should I put my money if they're going to have surrender charges? What the advisor should be doing is preparing the prospect within the sales presentation, we're going to hit singles and doubles, not home runs. We're going to create an income stream you can never outlive. We're going to talk about hitting uh, guaranteed growth compared to higher rates than your CDs. Whatever that high surrender charge value is, we need to put some kind of instant value in it and talk about the foundation of legacy money and additional income accounts and all that. So we want to talk about you know, having a surrender charge, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, is a good thing. 
I know agents all the time that say, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I would, I am glad you have a surrender charge. The reason why that surrender charge is there is because number one, it's a contract between you and the insurance company, but number two, it allows you to have all these benefits, the guaranteed return of premium. It allows you to have this bonus. It allows you to lock in your gains annually. It allows you to zero be your hero, never go down. So it can only go up and lock in your gains. So because of those surrender charges, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, that allows all these great benefits we've been talking about. Your money only going up, never going down, having a high bonus, getting that bonus to offset any losses, creating an income stream you can never outlive. Those surrender charges allow the insurance company to give you benefits in protecting your money and locking in your gains. Okay, So we have to be able to pivot and understand risk reversal, understand our products and how their language of, of an objection is just a way of saying, hey, help me understand. OK, just this. All they're saying in objection is saying, help me understand why this surrender charge. Help me understand how this low interest rate environment is going to help me. Well, Mr. And Mrs. Jones, this low interest rate in your accumulation value maybe have a cap of four or five percent. But remember, this is qualified money. We're purchasing this annuity because of a guaranteed income rider. And that a guaranteed income rider is guaranteeing you seven and a quarter percent right now, guaranteed while it's in deferral. Now, the only way it's guaranteed is because you have to take an income stream. But because it's qualified money, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, you plan on taking an income stream anyways because it's a retirement account. Am I correct? Oh, yeah, you're right. So on the accumulation side, it's more about the growth and protection of your money. And if case something happens to you, the accumulation value will go to your beneficiaries. But when we're talking about the guarantees and the growth, we're really truly talking about income here. And that low interest rate environment is not going to impact you because that 7% is guaranteed while it's in deferral for the next 10 years until you take an income stream. Oh, yeah, now I understand. Now I get it. So do you see how understanding your position, understanding the value in your sales process is going to help you overcome those objections without them actually being an objection, all right? Or what if they give you this objection of, I have to think about it. This means at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the client didn't want to buy from you or something went wrong in that bonding process. Maybe they didn't feel like you were like them. Maybe you didn't have enough small talk and listen or ask the right questions or, or maybe you didn't uncover a pain or a concern, okay? That's why we have our upfront value statement and disclosure along with our elevator speech, okay? We want, to, we want to explain to them the value of the products and services we deliver. We want to disclose the process in which we're going to do business if we do business. And then we want to have an elevator speech, which is going to make sure that our products and our services are memorable within 10 to 15 seconds, okay? So we overcome that objection right off the bat without them saying, oh, let me think about it. What they're really saying is they just didn't connect with you, all right? Because at the end of the day, prospects and clients have trust issues, ladies and gentlemen. They really, really do. They, they really have trust issues with their broker. They've been sold cars. They've been sold everything under the sun. So they have trust issues when it comes to being sold. That's why you need to come from a consultant or a, a sales or an educational uh, uh, process rather than a sales transactional process, right? Because of those issues. And a better way and a, and a great way to, to do that is it's always better to under-promise and over deliver. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, you asked me what if, well, what if how much is what's the best annuity you're going to get? What what's what are we going to get? Well, Mrs. Jones, I, I have to be honest with you. I always tell my clients they're going to see about 50 to 60 percent of the market performance. If the market goes up 10 percent, they're going to get five or six percent. If the market goes up 20 percent, they're going to get 10 to 12 percent. But at the end of the day, if they're getting eight percent or seven percent on some of these non-cap participation rate products or not, you've, you've over delivered, but you under promised and they understood based on the hypothetical quotes, based on the understanding of low interest rates, the guaranteed riders, they understood that. So you, you, you under promised, but you over delivered in that situation. That's how you get referrals and that's how you build trust. Uh, you make your client feel engaged and in control. They, they want to feel like they're engaged at appropriate times. You know, they want to know at the end of the year, what's the state of their, their current situation? Uh, what's the state of the economy and how that's going to affect them? How did this lowering of interest rate, you know, when, when, when the feds lower the interest rate, you should have automatically had some kind of email or communication sent out to your clients about how that's going to affect them doing business with you. So you want to educate them on a consistent basis. Call them when things are good. Call them when things are bad. 
At the end of the day, just call them consistently and, and communicate with them, okay? Keep in touch with them, and you're going to see that the referrals will come. They're going to add more money to annuities. They're going to buy other insurance products. They're going to be advocates for your business. They are really going to do more business with you, all right? And then here's probably the most important thing, ladies and gentlemen. Make their long-term time horizon feel short-term, okay? Don't use the word long-term. Use words like income strategy, growth, annual lock-in, creating an income stream anytime you could trigger income. Make sure that they understand that they have access to liquidity, options, a laddering products, income laddering. So there's a lot of things you can do from a planning standpoint that'll make their long-term horizon feel short-term and meet their, their short-term income distribution needs. OK, but again, that that allows us and that that only comes with working with us at National Brokerage. And, and, and how do we accomplish this? Well, obviously, all of our tools and resources. Uh, number one, we have to diagnose and we have to profile our clients on their goals, their fears and how they feel about their current situation. Suitability standards. Right. Then number two, we have to be able to deliver a solution. We have to be able to make recommendations and have an overview of our last meeting and regurgitate any kind of concerns that you may have when you went back and put these figures together. And then we have to be able to sell a specific product and a specific feature to those goals and concerns and how it coincides with their goals and concerns. Okay, so that's delivering a solution. Then we have to set expectations. We have to set the disclosure and suitability. Uh, we have to set the time frame of the money moving in the process uh, on how the policy is going to be issued. We also have to talk to them about conservation efforts of other financial advisors or institutions coming back and trying to not get them there to move their money. All right. Then we have to move on to sealing the sale. So do you see what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? We have to have a sales process in order to really structurally sound and set the foundation of overcoming objections uh, throughout the whole entire sales process, not to just get the sale, but to make sure that the sale is there and that they become advocates to your business. OK, so we need to seal the sale. We need to deliver the policy and documentations. We need to communicate expectations and educate them. We need to have client appreciation events and refer in order to get referrals we have to consistently keep communication open with them and educate them about other products and services that you deliver okay let them into your world let them know you personally and let them grow your business because they know that you care at the end of the day that's what it's about so let's take a look at some of the sales presentation material we talk about in our sales presentation in our PowerPoint presentations and our point of sales materials. At the end of the day, we want to have our standard disclosure and overcome the objections before they come an objection. And at the end of the day, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, my clients want to know a few things. And these they just want to know that their money is safe. Can I get to my money when I need it? Will I get a competitive rate of return? And will I have enough income to outlive my money and pass it on to my beneficiaries? All right, because at the end of the day, there are only two type of people. There's savers and there's risk takers. Savers want safety, guarantors, the return of their investment. They want to be able to know that they wake up the next day worth a little bit more. So they're willing to give up uh, the high yield, the fees, the risk, the volatility of the market, right? So at the end of the day, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, we want to take a look at the type of products that are available. And again, this is all part of sales presentations and materials. I don't want to go through because I know we went through it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so, so through this and how do we connect with the benefits of safe money strategies? Well, what we do, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, is we combine the best of both worlds, right? And we show them the features. We talk about safety. We talk about guarantees. We talk about uh, the return on investment, not the return of the return of their investment, not the return on their investment. Getting a fair rate of return, uh, uh, outpacing inflation, being able to know that your money's safe and secured on an annual basis. If we could get the best of both worlds, don't you? And feel like this would be the best thing for you. And again, these are all part of our sales presentations. I just want you to see that we guide you through that. So the same thing we say in our marketing material is the same thing we say in our appointment material. And the same thing we say in our closing material is the same thing we use on our sales presentation material in closing the deals. So we're, we're, we're regurgitating the same information consistently and we're constantly educating them about making the right buying decision. And when you do this, you're going to see it. it's all the same stuff. So our financial goal, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, is to create a financial future, all right? We have choice A, safety, guarantees, 
income for life, protection of your principal, tax advantages, a competitive rate of return, or would you want your money in risk, possible loss of, of principal, volatility, uncertainty, speculation of the market, and trying to time the market? As a retiree, what makes more sense, right? So you can see how all of this marketing stuff all sings the same song. It, it doesn't change, ladies and gentlemen. It really doesn't. But then what if they say, well, you know, I have, I have this chunk of money, but I don't want to put all of it in a new day. I still want to have a little bit of risk. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, let's let's kind of break this down into let's say like a financial retirement highway, right? So let's let's break this down. There's four lanes in what I call our financial retirement highway. The number one lane is our liquid lane. All right. That's our liquidity lane. That's 10% of your total assets should always be liquid, whether that's in a savings account, whether that's in a money market account, whatever that may be. You want to have 10% liquidity in case of emergencies, right? Then lane number two is what we call our protection lane, and that should equal your age. So if you're 70 years old, you should have 70% of your assets in something that is, is, is safe and protected and secured. Lane number three is what we call the passing lane, right? That's the risk lane. That's the difference of 100 and your age minus 10%. So if you're 70 years old, right? So you want to have 30% at risk, but you got to take 10% out for emergencies, right? So now you should only have about 20% of your total assets at risk. All right, that's just my recommendation, and that's just I think what you you would feel comfortable with. And then number four is the HOV lane, the carpool lane. You you just pass all the traffic, you don't have any concerns, you just keep on going, and you do nothing, okay? Because you still have that choice, right? So let's take a look at this, Mr. And Mrs. Jones, with three hundred thousand. Lane number one, we decide ten percent. So we're going to put thirty percent for liquid per, liquidity purposes in case of emergencies. Number two, we're going to put one hundred ninety-five thousand, something that is safe. Fair rate of return product that is guaranteed, right? So that is 195,000, right? 65%. Lane number three is 75,000 or, or more, right? So, so 75,000 in more riskier investment for growth. So we want to look at, you know, 25% of that. And then, you know, you decided to do nothing. So we're not going to put anything in if you decide to do nothing. So that's how it breaks. So what I would recommend, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, is out of the 300000 I would take 195000 and put it into something that is safe and secured with compounded growth on a tax advantage basis and give you the upside of the market, take away the downside, period. You can still have your money in the market. You can still have your money growing for you with risk. Um, and you still have access to 10% of your funds in case of emergencies. So you could see how we walk through those objections, ladies and gentlemen, and, and get the annuity sale, okay? Because it's all about being a safe money advisor and doing what's right by the client at all times, all right? So if anybody has any questions today about overcoming objections, working with National Brokerage, uh, getting access to our materials and sales presentations, shoot me an email. My email's on the screen. It's Nate A, that's N-A-T-E-A, -E at natbrokers.com. You can reach me at 800-377-6344, and my extension is 1155. Again, that's 800-377-6344, and that's extension 1155. Um, again, ladies and gentlemen, I don't see any questions. Uh, usually have some questions here, so hopefully it's not acting up, but uh, oh, someone said something here. Uh, <laughs> Patrick Sullivan, uh, you're the man. Patrick Sullivan is on fire, ladies and gentlemen. He's writing a ton of annuities. Um, Patrick is a, is a very good advisor. So um, if you have any questions, ladies and gentlemen, shoot me an email. Give me a call. If you're working on any life insurance cases, please, uh, please uh, uh, call your life insurance representative at National Brokerage. Give me a call if you don't have a life insurance representative, and we'll make sure you get you with the right people. If you're working on any annuity cases, give us an opportunity to show you that we can help you grow your business uh, with our tools and resources, and we would enjoy uh, doing business together. Uh, I thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. I know, it's, uh, I know it's valuable. Have a wonderful time. We'll talk to you in two weeks, not next week, but the next Tuesday after at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, have a wonderful uh, week. If you have any questions, I look forward to hearing from you. I'm going to give everybody a call that's been on this, that's on this meeting, and I'll touch base with you. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Have a wonderful day.